And we're talking about this 1956 television show. A pilot. Pilot. Pilot starring Don Taylor. This program was aired as a part of an anthology series, which seemed to be a specialty of Four Star. It was produced by Four Star Productions. Chevron Hall of Stars only aired in 1956, but Four Star had a bunch of other anthology programs through the years. Four Star was a big production company. In 1957, the series was started. Pilot was very different, I thought, because of Don Taylor. Uh, I thought he, he was a, a completely different actor than David Jansen. Now, here's a little bit of history for you. The show was on radio. And it was actually created by Blake Edwards. He created the radio show, and Dick Powell was the star. So Dick Powell made, makes the show famous on radio. They want to bring it to television. We can talk about Dick Powell a lot. At this point in his career, he had really mostly transitioned to a producer-director because he was the guy in charge of Four Star. Partners in Four Star were David Niven and uh, Charles Boyer, and and especially, and most importantly to me, Ida Lupino. But Dick Powell produced most of the programs that Four Star did and directed some of them. And occasionally he would act in some of them, but mostly he was, he was in charge at that point in his career. So Don Taylor was an actor of some, some skill. But he was in a lot of programs in the 50s, 60s. But somewhere along the way, he transitioned into director, and he, he directed more programs than he acted in. But his directing career started actually with Chevron Hall of Stars in 1956, and that was uh, because Dick Powell saw him as a director. He did not direct this episode, but he did direct other episodes, and actually was in four different episodes of this, of this series in that year, so he was involved in it quite heavily, but he spent a lot of time directing television episodes. M-Squad, you remember that one? Nine episodes? Sure do, yeah. Uh, Zane, Zane Gate Theater, six episodes. DuPont Show with June Allison, eight episodes. So he did a lot of work as a director. Actors transitioning into directing is not uncommon. It's, it's very common, particularly for women. Ida Lupino, I think, very well noted as a director. Ida Lupino wasn't the first, but she was an early director who had a lot of prominence, both as an actor and a director. And going back into the 30s, there were uh, several women directors who had a lot of programs that they, that they did. Great pilot, because if you remember the Richard Jansen series, this is a wonderful comparison to Richard Jansen. And by the way, it's a good program. It is. Oh, it's fun to watch. Anyway, let's wrap. I'm Grace. This is Vinny's Film Channel. This is Art and John from Celebrating Act Two. We'll see y'all on the flip side, I guess. to walk to work. My business is especially nice because you never can be sure you'll walk home from it. You might be carried home on a stretcher. But then for a hundred bucks a day in expenses, who minds a high mercurochrome bill every month? Of course, it's very hard work. You have to put up with strange situations and beautiful girls and ex-convicts and beautiful girls and all kinds of people and beautiful girls. Oh, I'd say it's rough, but it beats staying home and watching television. I just can't stand all that violence you see on television these days. Oh, I'm more the quiet businessman type. Routine, that's for me. First to look at the bulging files. Sugar's okay, but that erector set takes up so much room. And a quick check of the calendar. Know what day it is, boy. Press others with your knowledge, your calculating mind, your cool nerve, your steady aim. Oh, well. At least you know what day it is.
a detective agency. We trail them, we nail them. If they're guilty, we jail them. No charge for poetry. Oh, no. Oh, that's the sweetest groan I've heard all morning. Hi, honey. Rick, one morning I'm going to call you, and you are not going to have a slogan. I'm not? You're not. You're simply going to pick up the telephone and say, Helen, I love you. I am? You are. And then I'm going to say, I love you, too. Marry me? And then you're going to say, okay. Oh, that's what I like about you. A girl with a one-track mind. Rick, I'm serious. Oh, honey, a girl with a million dollars should never be serious. Now go count your money, get dizzy, and call me back. I will not. You're just ducking the issue. And how long do you think you can keep putting me... It was a nice average morning and started normally like any other morning. A call from a beautiful girl like Helen, wanting me to give up my purpose in life for a measly million bucks. What could be more normal? Helen Asher, blonde hair, blue blood, and green money. A technicolor dream with a sense of humor, yet only a fool would fight this. Meet Richard Diamond, private fool. Oh, well, we all have our little mental quirks. Huh, little. And what's more, if you don't come over for dinner tonight, you're going to wind up with the shiniest private black eye in town. Such violence. Oh, please, Rick. I'm fixing the whole dinner myself. All right, let's start off with a soup bowl of silver dollars and then a nice crisp green salad of $20 bills. Mr. Diamond, there are times when I think you are a very mercenary gentleman. I am not, and just to prove it, forget about the 20s. Let's make it out of 10s. After all, I'm just... Yeah? You, Diamond? In the rough. Oh, no. Oh, it's so it's old. No kibitzing. Who is it, a client? Yeah, it could be. See you at 7. Bye. Bye. Now then, Mr. Uh... I'm Eddie Burke. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Burke. Yeah. Eddie Burke, that's me. Yeah, I caught it the first time around. Well. Well? The package. What package? Oh, now, look, Diamond, don't stall. You've been paid. That's news to my bank account. Stand up. And get that package quick. No more fooling around. Take it easy, Burke. Now look, if you'd like to hire me for $100 a day plus expenses, I'd be glad to humor you and pretend I know what you're talking about. I got lots of screwy clients, but for free? I don't know what you're talking about. Casey got scared. She decided the package would be safer with a private eye. She paid you $1,000 to hold it till I came. You better not let Casey get near a lie detector. She'd break the machine. Now look, I never heard of her, you, or your package. So why don't you just put the gun away and beat it, huh? Casey, don't lie. You open it up, huh? Plan to cash in yourself. You ever wake up black and blue, smart boy? Something you won't forget for a while. You, you try it, Burke, and I won't forget you either. Don't talk big. You'll be hearing from me again soon, only the next time I contact you, you won't get off so easy. You'll have that package waiting for me. Keep your hands out. Oh, don't be... Oh, Mama always wanted me to be a violinist. But no, I had to become a private detective. Because I didn't use my head, my head is now used by every blunt object in town. I'm the only guy in New York who goes to the blood bank once a week for a refill. Ooh, it's an honest face. It's just the scars that fool you. But in my business, a little disguise helps now and then. Today, I decided I could pose as a pound of freshly ground hamburger. That should fool them. Oh, Richie. Well, Ricky boy. Well, Bridgie. You don't know how close you came to getting clobbered. Ricky, you've been sleeping on my floor again. I told you about that. I know. I'm incorrigible. You're in what? Oh, skip it. Look, Bridgie, my lease says that my office is supposed to be cleaned up by 9 o'clock in the morning. What were you doing all night? Playing Scrabble? Oh, you say the cutest things, Ricky. Oh, if I was 10 years younger. Yeah, if I were 10 years older. We'd really have a time, Ricky. Who slugged you? Was she pretty? Oh, honey, I don't know any girls who slug. Say it again. Say what? Honey. Honey. Oh, if I was 10 years younger. Let's not go around that again. I'd really chase you, Ricky. No, it wouldn't be fair. You wear tennis shoes. Bridgie, don't bother about cleaning up this morning. You want to leave those plasma spots there? Oh, sure. It gives the place a lived in look. Well, just as you say. Of course, the day ain't finished yet. I hate to have to mop up twice. Now, that's an encouraging outlook. Oh, I was only kidding, Ricky. You know I don't want you to get hurt again. You're a prince. Yeah, and still single. Gee, if I was just ten years younger... Bridgie, please. Well... You can't blame a girl for trying. No, sir, you can't blame a girl for trying. It was always fun to kid Bridgie, but inside I was mad. I didn't feel like waiting for Eddie Burke to contact me again. I'd rather find him first, minus his gun. So I called an old friend of mine at the 5th Precinct, Lieutenant Walt Levinson. 
I'm telling you, Walter, this joker just walked in here and bellowed me one right across the kisser. Good. Who is he? Well, I gotta know who it is. How can I make out a certificate of merit without knowing the guy's name? Oh, Walter, you are a living panic today. You really are. He said his name was Eddie Burke. I think he's a frustrated plastic surgeon. He walked in here, pulled a gun, and acted like I should have a package of his. Maybe he thought you were a Chinese laundry. Oh, chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. <laughs> Don't kill yourself, boy. Yeah, well, a few more like that, and I might. Back to the gory tale, Rick. Did you call me to cry on my shoulder or file an assault and battery charge? You know, if you had stayed on the force, these things wouldn't happen to you. Sorry, Walt, but I like to sleep on the job. This way I get a nap every day. Mm, and you got the lumps to prove it. Okay, okay, Rick, how can I help? Pull a file at Eddie Burke and give me the lowdown. He mentioned a girl named Casey. I want to know who she is and where she is and a list of Burke's other friends. I want to look them up. Maybe we can play some more games. Right, boy. Oh, bad. Real bad, Rick. Come on. Nice, huh? My new vaporizer. I got a breed in them foom. Cleared up my head. I hear you coming up in the world, Sneezy. Pickpocket's union, isn't it? Ricky, please don't use the word pickpocket. In the trade, we're known as cannon. Sorry, Sneezy. No disrespect. Ah, uh, common mistake. Yeah, I organize the boys. Keep them out of each other's territory. And, uh, take a percentage of the take. I'm saving up for a trip to a dry climate. Like the prison in Huntsville, Texas? Please, Ricky. Ah, oh, them fools. A guy named Eddie Burke, you know him, Stacy? I knew him a long time ago, when he was a cannon. But he never quite made it. Quit the racket years ago. The police have you listed as an old friend of his. I got lots of old friends, like you. Oh, I used to like Eddie. He had real thin fingers. Guy used to be an artist. I said to myself, this guy's got the makings of a real cannon. But you know, you never quite cut it. You're the only name listed on Eddie's folder, but he did talk about a girl called Casey. You know her, Sneezy? Nah. The only girl that they used to run around with was a... Ah, oh, them fools. Who ran around with Eddie? Hey, Ricky. You know, these vaporizers come to quite a penny. Now, this one set me back 15 bucks. Yeah. Have a sniff on me. Thanks, Ricky. Eddie used to go around with a girl called Rose Sanker. She worked at the Gaty Theater. You know the place. Yeah, I heard a whistle there. That girl did a great dance. She starts off when she starts to poo. Thanks, Sneezy. Oh, Ricky, why don't you come around for a social call? Maybe we could play a couple of hands of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, 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 the stage doorman at the Gaiety had a case of bad eyesight. Five dollars made it even worse. So I walked in to look around for Rosie Sanker. She was on stage and I had a nice view from where I was. I'm a sensation today. There's something exciting about a theater, especially this kind of a theater. It's women. Anyway, Rosie finished and came tripping back toward me. Uh, Miss Sanker. You got a summon? No. And I'm pleased to meet you. Well, my name's Diamond. Oh, I got kissed. Anyone I know? Could be. I'd like to talk to you. So would every guy in that mob out there. Of course, you don't look like most guys. Your clothes are pressed. Oh, I carry a handkerchief. I'm a real dude. And all you want to do is talk? I was a lonely child. Want to come in while I change? Well, I want to come after you. Where do you see my next costume? It's made out of carnations. I'll bet you smell the vine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell me, Rosie, you know a guy named Eddie Burke? Burke? That jerk? Make up another rhyme and tell me where I can find him. Try any gutter. He's strictly no good. How long has it been since you've seen him? You a cop or something? Or oh, something. Well, don't ask me about Eddie. He gave me a real bad time two, three years ago. I crossed him off for good. I like to do a little crossing myself. Why don't you tell me where I can find him, honey, and I'll build him one for you. Sounds swell if I knew where he was. When I first met him, he was a pickpocket. Before that, he tried to paint. He was a good painter, only he didn't make enough dough. And Eddie wanted dough. When he ran out on me, he was taken up in gravy. In gravy? Yeah. Like it? Love it. 
I can see why it didn't take long to put on. Snap me up, huh? Which pedal? Hurry up and do on stage. I'm a sensation today. I'll bet you are. Tell me, Rosie, what kind of engraving did Eddie Burke do? How should I know? He works for Nanny Warren at Nanny's garage. What's well, an engraver do at a garage? Initial gas pumps? Very funny. Why don't you ask Nanny? His place is over on 4th. And, uh, drop in and see the show sometime. Thanks, I will. Rosie, just curious, but aren't you afraid those flowers might wilt under those hot lights out there? Sure, that's the idea. <laughs> So far, I'd gotten nowhere in record time, so I took it out of my gas pedal and drove to Manny Warren's garage like a flash. Flash Diamond got a traffic ticket, but I can take care of traffic tickets easily. I just pay them. Hi. Hi, yourself. Yes. If you're Manny Warren, I quit. Manny's out to lunch. I'm watching the office. Who's watching you? You're not doing a bad job. You work here? Part time. The rest of the time? Why don't you call me and find out? Try the phone book. The phone book? Under Johnson. Alice Johnson. I was just fixing some coffee in the office. Care for a cup? That's the best offer I've had since you mentioned the phone book. Well, come on in. Manny had this garage loan? A few years. It's a good business. What a funny one for Manny. I remember him from college. You went to college with Manny? No, but I learned to read in college. Newspapers. Manny's picture used to be in them every time he was sent to jail. Cream and sugar? Black. Thanks. Mm, Any time. Oh, don't mind the eye. I look like that most of the time. Have you ever a guy called Eddie Burke? Burke? No. Should I? I understood he worked here. Well, I hadn't been here very long. Maybe Manny knows him. I think I have heard him speak of a Mr. Burke. Ever hear of a girl called Casey? Manny ever speak of her? Nancy Casey? Could be. Oh, Manny talks to her all the time. They're very close. Go on. Nothing wrong. You no, know, I just feel hot all of a sudden. Go on, tell me about Nancy Casey. Oh, she's a very nice girl. Very sharp, too. Oh, she can doctor a cup of coffee in the blink of an eye. Oh, no. And I'm not on the phone book, Mr. Diamond. Oh. And try and make it outside. Get some fresh air. Here, let me help you. I always help private detectives, Mr. Diamond. Nancy Casey, helper of poor suckers. Yeah. Oh, let, let's take the back way. Oh. So romantic. Better still, you look sleepy, Mr. Diamond. Suppose you take a nap. Mm, pleasant dreams. Why do these things always happen to me? Oh, well, grab what sleep you can in these hectic days. What now, Manny? Now we set things up and then scram. I don't know how long Marilyn and I posed for pictures, but when she left and I started to wake up, I felt something cold in my hand. I had a gun, and it was mine, and I didn't remember putting it there. I sat up as Walt and two cops rushed in. They looked, and I looked, and we all saw the same thing at the same time. Eddie Burke, as dead as the bullets from my gun could make him. Oh, Diamond. First you get beaten, then drugged, and now framed. Face it, boy, this just isn't your day. It's a very good thing Walt Levinson is a friend. Who else but Richard Diamond could be found beside a dead body holding the murder weapon and having a very good motive for murder and still get off? Walt knew I didn't do it, but someone had gone to great lengths to make it look like I had. Why? Why? I just said that. Huh? No, skip it. What are you doing here anyway, Walt? Tip on the phone. Girl's voice? No, man's voice. No, probably Manny Warren. Warren? How's he mixed up in this? This is his garage. Oh, well, now that gets clearer. You say Eddie Burke has got mixed up in engraving, and now we found out that he knows Manny Warren. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, what? Well, come on, Fatty, stop rubbing your chins and let me in on it. Ten years ago, Manny Warren was sent up on a counterfeiting charge. We never found the plates he used to make the queer money. But one of the reasons he was nabbed was that those plates had a flaw in them. You take it from there. All right, he gets out, opens up a place like this as a front, and then tries to find an engraver to correct the flaw on the plates. 
Simple. Ridiculous. Why kill Berg and why drag me into it? I'll tell you when we pick up Manny. Dad put on an APB on Manny Warren. And a girl named Nancy Casey. Brother, does she make strong coffee? You gotta go home and sleep it off, Rick. Why is everybody so concerned about my sleeping? I just like to go home and count sheep or something, you know, like normal people. I recite poetry to myself. I haven't put anybody to sleep. I like it. Look, just go find Manny Warren and Nancy Casey, will you? I'm gonna do some snooping at a flower show. What? Huh? Nancy Casey had this coffee waiting for me. I want to find out how she knew I was coming. What's that got to do with a flower show? Rosie Sanker. Rose who? A girl who wears flowers. Rose wears flowers at a flower show? She is the flower show. I don't get it. Get what? The flower show. Why should you care about a flower show? You're supposed to be out looking for Manny Warren. I know, but you just said that... I just said that I was going to go home and sleep. And you said something about reciting poetry. Now, a cop who recites poetry and wants to go to a flower show, that's okay with me. As long as he doesn't drag me along with him. So I'll just run along by myself, okay? Okay, Fatty. See you around. Coffee must have been loaded. Look, I told you, I don't even know this Manny Warren, except that Eddie was going to work for him. Now beat it, and let me clean up. Oh, let me help you, dear. Hey! Well, I can take off makeup real quick when I start getting a runaround. Now look, mister! You helped frame me for a murder, Rosie. Now let's not play footsie. Murder? Yeah, Eddie Burke. Oh, no, not murder. You tipped off Manny, didn't you? I... I told him you were coming over. Manny called this morning and said that if anyone came around looking for Eddie, to send them over, but to call first. It was worth 50 bucks to me. It was worth Eddie's life to him. I didn't know. Honest, I didn't. Don't use a word you don't know the meaning of. Where's Manny now? I don't know. Where's Nancy Casey? Well, she used to be Manny's girl, and then Eddie went to work for Manny. She and Eddie dated her quite a bit. Eddie liked her. Oh, Eddie liked her a lot. What's this? Nothing. A couple of plane tickets. One for you and your florist, or maybe one for Manny and Nancy. Can a girl take a trip? Yeah, Eddie took a trip. How'd you like to join him? Now, look! Where's Manny? I don't know. Where's Manny? Uh, Carlton Hotel, room 212. All right, put on your coat. We'll find a cop on the beat to take you downtown. Look, I, I needed the money, but I didn't have anything to do with Eddie getting... I mean... Manny paid me. Oh, that's fine. You can take your bank book along as a cellmate. The Carlton Hotel was on 35th Street, and it was after 2 when I got there. And then I had my first break of the day. A man was coming out of room 212. <laughs> I presume. Oh. You take the nightmares this round, Manny. I want to see your coffee-making girlfriend. Over here, friend. Sorry, I can't get up, friend. But a bullet can make a gal downright antisocial. I called Walt and told him to send an ambulance. Then I called the manager to have someone guard Manny Warren while I waited with Casey. Hey, uh... It's done. Uh, take it easy, honey. There's an ambulance on the way. I wonder you don't let me die. After all... Oh, forget it. It's all over now. Yeah. It's all over. You tried to kill me. Why, Casey? What's it all about? Plates. Counterfeit plates. All this over some stinking plates. You mean the package Eddie thought I had? He took the plates from Manny to work on. Then he decided we should double-cross Manny. He gave the plates to me. Told Manny he lost. But you gave them back to Manny. And I told Eddie I gave the plates to you for safekeeping. You came after Eddie. It was a chance for Manny to kill him. Put the blame on you. The double cross. Eddie tries it against Manny. You try it against Eddie, and Manny tries it against you. Nice crowd. Plates. A stinking plate. All this hurt over the stinking plate. You're a good 
understand pain. Never. You better keep quiet and lie still. I gotta talk. I can take my mind off the pain. Talk to me, darling. Oh, sure, Casey. I'll talk to you. You swim, Dan? Yeah. I used to like to swim. Oh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, but my back, it hurts. And if you could stand by. Sometimes it's better to pass out. At least it doesn't hurt anymore, does it, kid? Nancy Casey got a stretcher and a chance to get well. All I got was dear old Walter Levinson. Well? Well, what? You spent a hectic day for nothing. If you were still on a force, you'd at least be drawing a salary. Walter, my boy, let me give you the facts of life. I make $100 a day plus expenses. When you have a client? Well, I have a client at least once a week. I'm only counting the ones who live. Rick, my boy, I'm going to have to talk to you like a father. Oh, fatty. No, no, wait a minute, Rick. What you need is to get back on a force. Steady job, good woman, children. So you make pretty good dough in this racket, but what does it get you, huh? Are you still talking to me like a father? Yeah. Well, then I can't answer you because my father would be shocked at the money I spend. Going down one? Okay, okay. Well, someday you're going to be very old and very lonely. Yeah, and very rich. Which reminds me, I'd better call Helen. Can you lend me a dime, Walter? Sure, I can't get you something to help your face. Mm, got an old gas mask handy? No, but I've got a pound of liver in the icebox. You're very funny. <laughs> Tell me, is the coffee drugged? Drink it, then you'll drag me to the altar. All of a sudden, I'm not even a little bit thirsty. <laughs> that burlesque dancer, Rosie. Mm -hmm. Was she pretty? Mm, I suppose you might say she was, especially in that costume made out of carnations. I hope you were on your good behavior. I didn't pick any of the flowers, if that's what you meant. Rick, I hate to sound nagging, but I worry about you. In every case, you seem to run into a blonde, a redhead, or a brunette. I have to tell you about that bald-headed dame in the I'm scrub. serious. That isn't like a woman. Here I was, slugged, drugged, and framed, and all you care about was whether the girl I was with was pretty or not. Ah, oh, you poor, misunderstood boy. Come here. Let me rub your head. Mm. Is that better? Much better. Comfy? Mm -hmm. Cozy? Mm -hmm. Marry me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You dog. Oh, come here. Tell me, would I look just as good in a costume of carnation? Oh, baby, you'd look great in a costume of poison ivy. Hi. Before we sign off, I'd like you to join me in going over the books, so to speak. You've just seen the first of the Richard Diamond series based on a script, well, uh, one of over a hundred radio plays bound together in these books. Anybody who's ever been connected with a series knows that that's a wealth of material. And to boot, we have Dick Carr, who wrote many of these scripts, adapting them for television. Everybody here at Four Star, Charles Boyer, David Niven, and especially Dick Powell, is very excited about this series. I say especially Dick because, as you probably know, he created Richard Diamond on radio and is now going to head this series as executive producer. Everybody is excited, including myself. Dick Carr, Dick Powell, Dick Diamond. <laughs> Excuse me, looks like I've got another case. <laughs>